Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the uh, TEDx El Paso team. Uh, today I want to talk to you about storytelling by doing some storytelling, nested storytelling. The king of Ireland fought a very difficult battle and at the end of it he came victorious and he turned afterwards to the court's poet and asked him to compose an ode, a poem that would surpass all of the poems ever written, that would declare that moment, that event that had happened as the most momentous occasion in the history of Ireland. The poet, swallowing deeply, said, I'm up to the task. And he requested three years to accomplish this task to the king. The king said, very well, but come every year and give us your progress. After the first year, the poet came, the poet came to the court with a big manuscript. And he read from the manuscript. And the people of the court and the king were amazed at how those metaphors and similes and uses of language beautifully described the horrendous massacre that happened against the Norwegians that year ago. So the king was pleased and gave the poet a silver mirror. A year later, the poet came back and he stack, like Becky's book, was smaller. And amazingly, he was able to then recite almost from memory from that book, but somehow the metaphors were not matching as well. Some people in the court were a little surprised and the king was at first baffled, but slowly they realized that the most intricate metaphors and the narrative that now was weaved together was really a beautiful description of what happened. And the king, if not everybody in the court, was very pleased and he gave the poet a golden mask. After a year, he came back again, this time with no manuscript under his arm. He looked pale, worried. He faced the king. I could only mutter one sentence that nobody else but the king heard. And at that point, the king took his throne away from himself, took his crown, walked away and became a beggar until the end of his days. But before that, he gave a dagger to the poet, which promptly he used to stab his heart after he left the court. This is a story, not of the king of Ireland, but a story of how a group of individuals, some engineers, professionals, philosophers, artists, came together and thought it is possible to tackle the fundamental problems, the difficult questions, if we think that maybe by looking at how those questions appear in our communities, we may step by step find ways of handle those problems as they appear in our communities, and then in the process learn what it means for the larger question, the big theoretical questions, the big fundamental problems in philosophy and humanity. As they appear, they can be possibly understood step by step. So the projects that we began to create are geared to do that, to look at how the problems, fundamental problems appear, and then to see how to solve them by utilizing the best resources that we have in our communities, and in turn doing philosophy and doing high-end research in the process, hopefully. So we started this organization, but the whole point of it is not the organization. The whole point of it is what kind of fundamental problems, what problems do we have? And I know, if I was to ask you, you have problems. We all have problems. Human beings naturally have problems, and as Sartre said, the number one problem of people are other people. Sartre said that hell is other people. So partly because of that, but partly because the problem of identity is one of the largest problems in metaphysics and philosophy, and it defines and touches almost any other problem, and it's relevant to the themes of the conference, and it's relevant to the poet and the king, and it's relevant to every single one of us. That's the one we chose to tackle, but really any fundamental problem you want, we can make it into a project if we see it as it appears in our community. And of course, you can ask, how does it appear in our communities? Well, to that I'll tell you another story, and it's going to take a while to develop. But we, I was, when asked who you are, or when we ask ourselves, who am I, we have some things to say. I mean, we really say, oh, I don't know, who are you? You tell me. I mean, we may do that. But normally we have some things to say. 
And sometimes they're pretty boring things, like, I am who I am. You know. This is what you get. You know. And that's already a problem. If you say, well, I am a body. OK, that's good. So take a second. Be careful. It's a dangerous activity. So touch the boundaries of your body. OK, don't be afraid. Go ahead. You're afraid. Don't be afraid. OK, I'll, I'll demonstrate. OK, it's, it's. OK, some of you are having too much pleasure at the moment. Uh, be careful. But now, remember that that may seem obvious, but it's a little tricky because maybe our physical cells go beyond these seemingly clear, obvious bounds. Maybe my heat layer, maybe my heat layer is huge. I'm very hot. I don't know about you, but. So we have different physical boundaries, even when we talk about our bodies. I mean, what are our boundaries, right? And you know that because you're sitting next to somebody who's very hot and you're like, Phew. and by that, you can take it metaphorically as well. Don't touch him, though. Don't just... All right, so I am who I am. I am a body. But often we're not satisfied with this. Or if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you're a nice body, and maybe qualified by a sexy body, you may go, well, se oh, wait a second. I'm not just a sexy body. I'm more than that, right? <laughs> Regardless of what Britney Spears says, I'm more than this. And I, I don't know what Britney Spears says, but um, <laughs> some may add things like, I'm a body and I am more, a spirit, a soul, something that reaches out, something that goes beyond these bounds, these obvious bounds, something that it's larger than myself. We say these things, right? And it makes sense. Because oftentimes, if we, even if we don't agree we have a soul, we will describe ourselves with the things that go beyond us. We describe ourselves with the things that we do. Okay? So if I say, who are you? Oftentimes, you might say, well, I am somebody who works. I am somebody who does certain things. I am what I do. Okay? And as we wait for the next slide. Sometimes I will say, well, I also am what I did, right? So not only what I'm doing now, but what I did before defines me. And if you're a little risky, you may even say, I am also what I will do, which is a little risky because you may not do it. I will conquer the world, or maybe not. But if you're set on conquering the world, that might define you. Right? So ask somebody who has that view. Does that define you? And it does. And oftentimes, as well, when we say that I will do, we can say what we will do. Because we are our potential, and not just my own potential. Because as I cross the boundaries of myself, of my physical being, I go beyond with my spirit. Okay? As I recite an ode to the king, I go trembling upon the king. I'm afraid, but I give what I have. I become that. I become the potential. We are our potential. And that sounds really good. And we tell our children, you are potential. And education is about cultivating your potential. But dad, what does potential mean? I don't know, but there you go. I mean, oftentimes, it's amazing how the little things, the simple questions, we haven't paid enough time thinking about them. And of course, that's the job of philosophers. Because oftentimes we're very annoying because have you thought about the term, hello? <laughs> no. Should we? No, not really. But potential is worth it. Right? So we trick you to it. So potential is worth thinking about because it's part of what we are. It's part of what we hope to be. We may or may not do it. If we understand it well, we may do it. Or don't do it if it's bad. Right? Mm. So there's bad potential. So what does potential mean? And in fact, we can go back to Aristotle, the great philosopher, the philosopher, to understand some key ideas. And just very briefly, um, Aristotle conceived of one of the causes of why things are the way they are as the final cause, which means, for instance, if an archer is shooting an arrow, or imagine somebody who has never shot an arrow before but wants to be an archer, grabs the bow, grabs the arrow with great style, like I'm doing, and chooses not to throw the arrow. I mean, is he an archer? Well, it depends, right? If he does, and then becomes really good and strikes the bulls at every single time, that becomes a good archer, becomes an archer, the good archer. But if he never does, he's just the potential. 
So the potential may or may not be, that's what he calls the final cause, the telos. And that is also what helps him understand what change is and what being is. And he uses the term energia, which is where the term energy comes from, which we use nowadays very freely. But do you know what energy means? Ah, it's one of those terms. I have lots of energy. What does that mean? Well, I don't know, but I have lots of it. Right? <laughs> and energy of being at work for Aristotle is in the now. But then there's potentiality or dynamis, which is the word where the word dynamics come from, is what we're about to do. And sometimes it's very close. I'm about to say the next word. And again, right? I mean, it's very close sometimes, the potentiality, and sometimes it's very far away. 20 years from now, who knows, right? But it carries some implications. It carries some concerns. There are problems there, the fundamental problems, because how do we cultivate that potential? What do we do about it? Okay. So that, of course, has been a great topic of discussion in philosophy and in many fields. And sorry, I went back. I accidentally pressed the wrong button. Now, in, if in life you could do that, that would be fun. <laughs> All right. So in the next slide, we can see what happened when people took some of those ideas in the scientific revolution, people like uh, Laura Kelvin, who in a generalized, an attempt to generalize Newton's mechanics, took the concept of energy, potential like kinetic energy, which was used by Leibniz on the right for the first time. And then Rankin was an engineer who applied those concepts, and he was stuck on how to make a steam engine more efficient, so he started reading Aristotle. Right? Like, oh, now I got the idea. And according to his words, that's what he did. To take those concepts, those ideas, which in many ways are still confusing and still worth a definition or two, and apply them into a model for physics that works and still works very well, that it was, became generalized mechanics and also has been used in uh, quantum mechanics and other aspects and parts of physics, so and other, and other sciences. So in generalized mechanics, we have a simple idea. Energy is your current energy, your kinetic energy, plus your potential energy, okay? But what does it mean that I am my energy now, but also the energy that I, I will have later? I mean, does that, that make sense? Because the potential energy may never come to be. If you have a car sitting on the edge of a cliff, it's got a potential energy given by the distance it has to fall by the gravitational constants. And, I mean, but the car may never fall. So it's a bit of a problem because in our model that works very well, we conceive of systems as having something that maybe in reality maybe they don't have unless they do it, okay? So does it make sense? Some water. <coughs> Excuse me. How can we be made of something that may never come to be? And we talk about this potential, right? It may cease to be immediately when I realize I cannot make it in the MBA and I'm too old, right? I mean, <laughs> some potential that might never be there, but some potentials can be there. And that problem, the problem of how our models, whether it's a poem or a scientific theory or a mathematical model, gets applied to reality, it's a problem for all of the sciences. We know that that's what science tries to do, come up with the right models. And it's a problem for philosophy. Oh, thank you. I actually am not thirsty. I just wanted Eric to work. Sorry. Just joking. So is it just part of our mathematical models that potentiality exists, but in fact, in reality, the potential doesn't, mean it doesn't really mean much? Well, when we think about models, whether it's a poem, a poem to a king, or a narrative, or a story, or a scientific theory, those are important moments because oftentimes we make mistakes. And of course, we can talk about the models in our minds and how they apply to reality, right? We all have this issue, the problem of modeling, okay? And one of them can be, one of the problems is when we take our model or reality to be more real than reality itself. We all do that, right? That's why we flip people off when we're driving, right? You cut me off, you're in the wrong, clearly. And then of course, until my children say, why? Why are you cursing at them, dad? It's like, oh, did you hear that? I mean, we, create realities in our heads, and of course, we study that in psychology and in sociology and philosophy, and then we think they're more real than reality. That's what we flip people off. How come are we that confident? Rather than, oh, maybe it was my fault. I'm sorry. Let me think about this. Let me do a study. Whether, 
We don't do that. We just assume we're right and you're wrong. Go to hell. Okay, grandma. <laughs> so all the mistakes is also when we take the models and we don't take them seriously enough. Okay, that happens as well. The sentimentalist fallacy is a nice example, is a, a narrative of how we take sometimes the models too seriously. And it's given by William James when he tells the story of how an old lady in Boston in a cold winter's night goes to see a theater play, in which in the theater play, there is an old lady that goes to see a, a theater play. And in the cold, there's a carriage driver freezing to death. And the old lady in Boston watching the play, she's crying, feeling sad for the carriage driver while her own courage driver is actually freezing to death in the streets of Boston. And then goes out and then, come on, get home, Jimmy. I mean, so quickly we realize that these things are common, these mistakes, these errors. What about the potential? Are we right to think that it's just a model? And we shouldn't take it too seriously? Well, it so happens, and I have to go quick about this, and forgive me for this, that fields of science nowadays, like quantum mechanics, they have taken some of this seriously because it has become a problem. Partly it's because the definition of a whole system, like an electron in quantum mechanics, we're said to be made of its potential. Let's assume that an electron, as it does, have this property called spin, which has two values, up and down. Let's imagine that. Well, before measuring an interaction, before it smacks its bounds with something else, we say that the electron is both up and down. Not up and down because we don't know what it is, but it's really up. We just don't know. No, no, it's really up and down. It's the sum of its possibilities. Quantum mechanics expressed with the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet with the letter psi. The state of the system is all of its possibilities. Okay? And now we know in addition that there's some effects like the Aronman bomb effect, for instance, that indicates that these potentials are very real, not just part of the model. It so happens we are made of our potential. Ooh, okay, that's cool. But what do we do with that? Dad, what are you going to do with your potential? Well, that's a good question, son. He never asked that, but imagine if he did. So it says that I'm really my future. Of course, I know I'm my future. Of course, I depend on external things, like not getting run over by a tramway or something. But I am my future. I am my potential. How, how am I going to cultivate that? What am I going to seek to, to ensure that as I go beyond my bounds, my physical bounds, my intellectual bounds, and interact with others, how can we cultivate this? And more importantly, how does that appear as an issue in our communities? Okay. So I am a future. I depend on external systems. I necessarily then mean that we're about breaking those boundaries. Okay. So in breaking those boundaries, which we do fundamentally, what we found as part of our team is that, okay, so what can we do about this? What is worth you know, cultivating regarding potential? And of course, education, our children, we thought. And there's a problem when we have, let's say, our children, and we don't feel maybe that they're sufficiently given the options to explore their creativity, to get into situations where they can really do science. Okay, maybe because the system in place, you know, wants more to create citizens that just follow orders. And of course, I want my children to follow orders, which they never do. So I've done a good job maximizing their potential because they ignore me completely. But the reality is, I mean, what can we do? So it's a fundamental problem, and we feel the fundamental problem is solved when those relevant parties involved, they all will say, sounds good, potentials are maximized, let's move forward. So when the parties benefit, of course, we could discuss that, and there's some issues there. But so what we seek then is to create simple projects that are easy. Love of wisdom. We want kids to love wisdom. We want kids to go to school and go, wow, this is cool. I want to go back tomorrow. Dad, don't. Don't take me home. I just want to stay here and do more scientific experiments. That's what we want, right? Rather than drag them in the morning, come on, you know. Whoosh. No, I don't do that really. Um, and to do that, you need to offer them things that they're going to make it love it. And telling them that they need to do this because, or because the curriculum in Texas mandates it, I mean, that, that's not motivation. The kids need motivation. What kind of motivation? Tell them good stories. Good stories, sort of uh, stories done in collaboration with others. Jake Valentine has done these drawings, this artwork in today's presentation, just for this presentation, some of it, that indicates that collaboration, working with others, makes it better. Have them collaborate, have them create art. So what we seek to do, and a subset of the love of wisdom is a love of learning project, is to include philosophy, to include logic and ethics, and character, character building, teamwork, but in an inquiry-based program in which the kids are constantly being challenged to produce 
interesting ideas. I went to a kindergarten class and we were discussing whether a grandfather axe, if you change the handle 20 times and the head 30 times, is it the same axe? And kids were saying amazing things and they were having a debate, okay? We were able to go to a fifth grade class and, to, and show and demonstrate that to them and then they were able to go home and do that to their parents that a moving observer's clock slows down, lags in relation to a stationary observer. Which if you go to college, good luck to you getting a relativity lesson on that, right? But the kids were able to do it. Oh, that's too advanced. They did it. But well, we didn't do some of the math, but they were asking for it. Don't leave us. They call me mister. Don't leave us, mister. Tell us more. It's like, well, no, I have to leave because I have to go pick up my kids from school. Cool. In other words, you have kids finding ways to want to know more, want to demand more. And that happens when you face them with the tough questions, the real questions in life, in a narrative. So part of the narrative has been to have a character that goes into space and goes through these adventures. But part of that, the narratives that come out are the stories of science, the stories, the history of the world. And it combines interdisciplinarily with the different disciplines, whether it's psychology and sociology. In other words, give the opportunities to the kids to do great things. Have them do models. They work with models very well. They work with stories very well. They can navigate the story of the king with the poet, with the story of Iggy, and the story of themselves very well. They can go back and forth and understand that if you just give to the king what he wants, that's the easiest. But if you give him the true, beautiful poem, beauty personalized, then the king may no longer be king and the poet may no longer be a poet. So this collaboration, it happens throughout. It happens with the kids, it happens with the teachers, but also with organizations. So thanks to those organizations that made these things happen and we look forward welcoming you if you're interested in joining us in the future. Thank you.